In this video, we're going to talk about learning theory in media design. So first we'll explore four different learning theories and talk about what they mean. And then we'll apply those to basics in media design. So here's the four learning theories. Learning theories describe uh, different assumptions about how we learn. So they have different definitions about what it means to learn, how that learning can happen, and how we can actually support it. So this has the implication that how do we design instruction? How do we design media for learning? It depends on the learning theories we're using. There's not one right and one wrong. We can mix them together. It's just good to be intentional so we can think about how we're designing. So first we're going to talk about behaviorism. So here is Pavlov who trained the dog that whenever he rang a bell, then he gave the dog food. And so then eventually when the dog would hear the bell ring, which is a stimulus, he would have the response of drilling. So this is kind of a funny little comic that watch what I can make Pavlov do. As soon as I drool, he'll smile and write in his little book. So in this case, the drool is the stimulus and writing Pavlov writing in his book is the response. Behaviorism design, defines learning as a change in behavior. So the dog has learned when he changes his behavior to drooling when he hears the bell. Um, learning happens through the stimulus and response process that we're talking about here. And we can encourage learning by repetition, providing rewards. Since learning is all about changing behavior, it happens very easily as we repeat something and we reinforce something. It's a little more complex than that, but that's the basic idea. Cognitivism looks at learning different. It's more about what happens in the brain than our behavior. So in cognitivism, learning is when we're acquiring and storing information, we're interpreting and understanding it. Again, this is an oversimplification, um, but basically it's the stuff that happens in the brain. Learning happens through memory processes, and we can encourage learning through clear explanation, spaced repetition, those things that help us remember and understand things. This is how a lot of instructional designers think, how a lot of education um, is designed. A more recent theory is constructivism. Constructivism is a more about how the learner puts the ideas together themselves. So learning is kind of creating that personal meaning, coming to understand something in your own way. It happens through experiencing something and interpreting it in your mind and building connections between the things you've interpreted. And we can encourage it by providing opportunities for exploration because as we explore, we communicate with each other, um, we start to develop those ideas. Our fourth theory isn't quite as popular as these others. It's, it's quite a bit newer. It's called connectivism. And it's uh, created by someone named George Siemens. Connectivism is more of a learning theory for the digital age. So you think of how we learn with the internet. We don't always have to remember everything. We have to know how to find the information. So in connectivism, learning is making connections. They can be connections with other people. They can be connected connections with non-human objects, different technologies, the internet, etc. cetera. Um, but it's being able to act and do things because of those connections, not because it's all internal to yourself. Learning happens through processes of connecting people, tools, and ideas. And we encourage it by exposure to broad networks of people and information and teaching them how to learn. So this kind of responds to the idea that over time, what we know, what we do, how we act changes. And so learning is more being able to adapt to those changes and make those connections. So here are four learning theories, behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism, connectivism. They have each have different ways of thinking about how we're going to support that learning. Now let's talk about how this applies to media design. What does that mean about when you're creating instructional videos or books or texts or slides? Most of this theory is built on cognitivism. And this is a basic cognitive model where we get memory. We have sensory memory information comes in. Some of it we forget, some of it we remember. Some of it goes into working memory. And when we have working memory, that's when we're thinking about something and we're processing 
processing. Some of that we forget, but the stuff we're able to understand and think through clearly becomes encoded in long-term memory, which then we need to be able to retrieve later when we need it. So this means that we need to support this ability to have this stuff in working memory and move it into long-term. And that happens through the rehearsal and the repetition. Um, it also, uh, there's some other things you can do to chunk and remember things, but that is the focus of cognitivism. So we're going to talk about this idea of cognitive load. And this is a really important principle for uh, designing media for learning. We're just gonna do a basic understanding of that this time. So first, cognitive load. Cognitive load is all the stuff you have to think about when you learn something. When we talk about intrinsic cognitive load, that's how complicated the actual content we're learning is. So maybe we're learning the names of animals. That's somewhat simple, especially for adults. Although if you're learning the names of animals in a different language, that's gonna have a higher cognitive load. Or if you're learning calculus, that will have a higher cognitive load if it's a difficult concept. And of course that depends on how much experience you have in the discipline and with the ideas. The next is extraneous cognitive load. Extraneous cognitive load is the stuff that comes in that's not related to what you're learning. So if I'm looking at a screen and I'm, there's other colors I'm seeing, there's other features, there's sounds, there's movements, that's going to add extra cognitive load. And the result is sometimes we can overload that working memory, that memory that stores what we're trying to deal with. Of course, if the intrinsic cognitive load is a little bit lower, it's, you know, we can have a little bit of extraneous, but if it's a very difficult concept, it's important to keep, to really try to minimize that extraneous cognitive load so we can really be able to use our working memory well. We can have external cognitive load through pictures, words, fonts, colors, sound, off-topic information. This doesn't mean we can never use these things and the way we use it can actually reduce cognitive load instead of increase it. But if we use extra stuff that's unrelated, we just have to be aware that it might increase cognitive load, external cognitive load, making it more difficult to learn. Alrighty. So one way to, to look at this, I, I really like this image, um, causes of cognitive load can actually just be your mood. When you have inconsistency where fonts change all the time or colors change, when the displays confused, confusing, or when you're not ready for the content you're being introduced to, that's going to increase cognitive load. And it actually has consequences. It makes learning harder. It feels like hard work. It's unfamiliar. Sometimes it can even feel untrue and bad. It can have that emotional impact if we have too much cognitive load. So when we design media for learning, we generally want to make it clear, simple, and pleasant. We don't want to add extra details that are going to increase that extraneous cognitive load um, unless they're going to actually help the learner, particularly if it's a difficult concept. The next idea is grouping or clustering ideas. When we talk about short-term memory, um, you know, you think about phone numbers. I'm sure a lot of you learned that most people can keep five to seven things in their mind at a time. And so we have our phone numbers that are usually seven digits plus an area code. But when we have our phone numbers, we cluster them. We have three numbers and then four because it's almost like those two groups become two chunks instead of seven chunks. So they've done, there's been a whole bunch of research on clustering concepts and how it can actually increase learning, help us handle more stuff in our short-term memory and remember more. We can cluster by putting things into groups. If we create a hierarchy so we can organize information in our head, we can use sequences of time and group similar ideas. The next principle um, is accessing prior knowledge. So when we talked before about cognitive load, if you're not prepared for learning something, it can make it much more difficult. But if you help the learner access, retrieve that knowledge that is more long-term before they start a new idea that has to do with that idea, that'll help decrease how difficult it is for them to learn. 
Now we've been focusing here on cognitivist principles, but that doesn't mean that that's the only way to learn and the only thing to consider when you're designing media for learning. Um, we also have a lot of social learning theories. They talk about how we learn through connecting to people, how we learn through a sense of belonging. And we have motivational theory. What's actually going to motivate people to learn? Maybe your students are going to be very bored if everything follows these theories. Maybe you have to add something a little more interesting sometimes to keep them engaged. And that's okay. Um, so some other principles are connecting to personal identity. If your learners are actually connecting to the content and connecting it to themselves, it can help them really remember it more and have a more positive experience with it. Also, if we emphasize the learner experience, trying to make it a pleasant and happy and enjoyable experience, that can be a very good thing. So maybe normally you don't want to bring in external uh, things like showing a random movie click clip in the middle of a lesson, but maybe that is going to really motivate your learners. If the content has a low enough intrinsic cognitive load where it's not as difficult, it might be appropriate to bring in some external things to increase that experience and that um, engagement and motivation in learning. So it's just using these principles wisely. So takeaways for this video, learning theories describe what is learning, how learning happens, and how we can encourage learning. Media theory based on cognitivism emphasizes optimizing those cognitive processes, those memory and understanding coding and coding processes. And other perspectives on learning might call for other considerations. Thanks for watching.